So, boys, <laughs> see us if they show up. We're, uh, we're live. No more, no more telling stories behind everybody's backs. <laughs> oh, I see the participants flowing in. 2023. Here they come. So, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give people a couple minutes and uh, or a minute or so, and then we'll do the official welcome. But it's nice to see that we uh, we have a room filling up. Mm -hmm. Up to up to thirty nine at the moment. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's like a real wine dinner. <laughs> yeah. Skull from Minnesota. From Paul. Hello, Paul. Skull. Skull. New Jersey. There you go. Yep. Yeah. David. Rye, that's you. I guess I'll just cheers you. Yeah. Mike, nice to see you out there. Oh, we got some. Oh, yeah. So you guys are going to have to, <clears throat> we'll all do our best to uh, to keep track of the chats and the, <clears throat> and the Q&A as we go along. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you recognize that your question just didn't get answered, um, just ask it again. Ask it again. So I think I think we can get started with some introductions. Um, I'm Dominic Chapelet. I'm not Cyril Chapelet. I know he was on the uh, he was the headliner tonight, but uh, he he couldn't make it, so he tapped me. And uh, hopefully, you're not all too disappointed. Um, you know, there's been a number of you out there who have been following these webinars really since we started really going at them uh, during COVID. And I just want to thank you all for doing that. Uh, it's been something that's that's fun for us, keeps us focused, hopefully keeps you all engaged and gives you, you know, another option for what you want to do on a Thursday evening or Thursday night. Um, a couple uh, shout outs that I was asked to uh, to give. And if I don't call your name out, I would if it was on my list, so don't worry. But uh, Gene and Lori Pingatori from uh, Fishers, Indiana, or Pingatori Fishers, Indiana. Is that what it? No, from Fishers, Indiana. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Alan and Gene Gleason uh, from Katona, New York, and Rich and Cindy Wilson from Clayton, California. Um, thanks for being a part of all of this and uh, being on many of these. Um, at this point. If you don't have any wine in your glass, that's a problem. We all have wine in our glass. We are ready to go. Uh, so, so take a minute, make sure you're doing that. And uh, we can, you know, as we go through, we'll be talking about the specific wines that we uh, that we have on our list here and that hopefully are in your uh, club shipment. Um, and for those of you who don't want to break into your club shipment right now just for our webinar, uh, this is an opportunity for you to get to you know, know the wines ahead of time uh, before you decide to open them up with, with family or friends. Um, and then at this point, I have to introduce the other two gentlemen on the screen. Of course, uh, Rye Richards has been part of many of these webinars uh, over the last few years. He is our associate winemaker and an integral part of our winemaking team, um, you know, on all levels. Uh, he's out in the vineyard. He's he's in the winery. He's, you know, on, on forklifts. He's... Uh, He's moving barrels and 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 telling everybody else how to do it better. So uh, <laughs> we're just really lucky to have him. And uh, thanks, Rye, for being part of this today. Um, Thank you, Dominic. Matthew McIntyre has been with us. I don't know. We we were talking about it five or six years. There might have been a gap in there somewhere. Um, Matthew started with us in the tasting room, mm -hmm. and uh, then decided that he he wanted to to go back home, and uh, he he left us for a little while. Went to uh, Kansas City or just Kansas? Yeah, I'm just outside of Kansas City. Oh, yeah, 20, 30 and minutes. Um, and so we were we weren't happy about that that he left. But uh, a few months later, it, there was an opportunity to uh, to bring him back into the fold. And uh, he's working remotely for us. We're really happy to have him back on board. Um, he has the club manager position now. And so those of you who are in our club, you may very well have had contact with him directly. Uh, if if not, if you have any issues, this is the moment to start writing things frantically in your uh, in your chat or your Q and A 
section. Uh, but Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Dominic. Um, hey, you know, can you just tell a little bit about, about yourself? I gave you, I probably said most of what you're going to say, but, but let us know um, where you are now and, and what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my background for, for those, if you haven't had a chance to chat with me, I hope you do eventually. Um, you know, my background is in culinary. So I went to culinary school in New York uh, with my wife as well, actually, at the CIA, not the not the intelligence agency, uh, but the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. And so we worked in the industry for about 10 years. And then I found a love of, of wine in my bachelor's and came out to Napa for a semester in 2014. And from there, I was like, well, this is this is my life now. I need to move to Napa. So so we moved to Napa in January of 15, and we left uh, May of 18 to come back to Kansas. So um, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I've called Kansas home since 1999. Um, and that's not like a year after I was born, if anyone's wondering. So I'm a little bit older than that. Um, but yeah, so my, my heart is in Pittsburgh, but I reside in Kansas and I'm classically trained as a chef. So I like to think I know when it comes to food and wine pairings, but, um, everything is subjective. So, uh, you can have whatever you'd like with these wines, but <laughs> as we go through them, I'll try to give some of my recommendations as we go. Nice. Thank you, Matthew. Well, yeah, you do look very young and I can tell you when you started at the tasting room, I was a little concerned. I, I wanted to uh, <laughs> check your ID because, uh, you looked about 15, so you haven't aged much. Uh, you're you're lucky. Uh, keep it up. So uh, I was asked. There was a couple of questions out there. One was, what wine are we starting with? Well, of course, uh, those of us who have access to all the wines might have all of them in our glass, but uh, I think we'll be starting off with the El Novalero. Um, and then somebody was asking about the the weather and and saying, you know, how how warm and lovely it was where they are. Uh, it's not warm and lovely today here, despite what you see behind me. Um, that is not what it looks like today. It looks a little different. Uh, it is one more storm rolling through California, and we're happy to have it. We'll take the we'll take the weather now. Um, as a matter of fact, almost all the way through March, we'd be okay with the weather. We'd really like it to back off at that point, let our vines do their thing, and get to the next stage. But uh, you know, we're glad to have the water. Um, Absolutely, the, bring on the rain. Yeah, specifically today, uh, we'll be having the 2021 Grower Collection El Novalero Chardonnay, the uh, Grower Collection Pinot Noir Dutton Ranch 2021, the 19 Las Piedras, and the 2018 Altimeter Cabernet Sauvignon. A really, really great lineup. Um, couple of these wines on here, uh, I think we may end up talking about quite a bit. Um, so anyway, Rye, catch us up to what's happening 2023. 2023, well, you just talked about rain. Um, Matthew's got a few pictures of this extreme weather pattern that we've been having. If he wants to pull those up for you, I can kind of get you up to speed. Um, yeah. So this was just last week. Um, we had snow here on Pritchard Hill, about five inches. Uh, and so, you know, my team and the vineyard team rolled in around, you know, six or seven, and we managed to get on site. And then we promptly told everybody else to to stay home. Uh, we had a snow day at Shapway because we had many downed trees, uh, lots of snow, uh, and it was just, it was beautiful. Um, I think we've even got a, a few more shots. Um, for those of you who want to know if snow and, and vines are a problem. Uh, it's not at all. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Right now, all the vines are dormant. Um, they're waiting to be pruned or already have been pruned. And uh, so snow really is, is not a big deal. Uh, it's actually warmer than, you know, deeper freezes that can cause vine death. Uh, that's more of a, a Minnesota, Virginia problem, not a California problem. Um, so this kind of melted away in a few days and we just love it because it's not only beautiful but nourishes our local water table and aquifers. Um, so no on Pritchard Hill is kind of the most recent news. Uh, other than that, we're busy bottling our 2021 Mountain Cuvée currently uh, and kind of prepping ourselves to, to get ready to rack a bunch of 22s. Um, 
and and looking forward to the rest of our bottling season as we kind of roll into early spring, getting into summer. Right. You just threw out rack like they all knew what that is. I'm sure there are <laughs> some people who would like to know what that means. Yeah. Uh, so racking a wine is when you uh, take the as as wine ages, there's sediment that falls to the bottom of a barrel. Uh, and our job is to, to constantly clean these wines up and keep them moving forward as we remove the clean wine from the top, you know, pump it out of that barrel, put it into a tank, homogenize our lots, and then return them back to barrel. So it's a constant thing that we're doing in the cellar is racking our wines, and that's to keep them fresh and and, uh, and evolving through the, the aging process. And then it also allows the, to pull wines together um, to blend them in approach to, to bottling. So that's the two ways we use racking in the cellar. Cool, thank you. Um... You know, be, before we get into the wines, uh, you know, we saw the pretty pictures of the snow and uh, and Ryan told a little bit about what that was like on the hill. Uh, he sort of he sort of blew by the, the oak tree issue. Um, he said, oh, yeah, a few trees down. It, there was a devastating amount of downed branches and trees. Uh, and actually, our crews here, we've actually had to hire some extra crews to come in and clean up the roads and uh, chop things up into firewood and you know get things ready and try to save some of the trees that really got hit hard it was really an interesting mm -hmm. thing you know those those 5 inches while they might not mean anything to you know um, to trees up in the in the sierras the the fir and the pine and and all that um, it was really wet snow and that little bit that sits on every oak leaf um, was was enough to really put a lot of weight on those branches, and uh, my my guess is that the trees were uh, were struggling these last two or three years in the drought, and they were trying to hold on to as much water as they could, uh, so they were already heavy. And then when this snow came down and and just added that extra, you know, two hundred, three hundred, a couple thousand pounds, depending on how many leaves it was on. Uh, we lost a lot of whole trees, branches, um, and for us, that that hurts. You know, these are trees that have been with us uh, well, well, well before any of us were here, and uh, and they're so much a part of you know Pritchard Hill and and what we love about being up here. So we're out there doing our best to uh, to maintain what we've got, and it's not like the whole forest is gone. You know, for us, we we recognize that there was a lot of damage. You'd probably wouldn't see it uh, unless we pointed it out. But um, but snow, you know, affects us differently here than it does in other areas of the country. And like Ryan said, luckily for us, the vines couldn't care less. They're they're sleeping. They're just all cozy down under the ground. And they're happy. tough. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, let's get to the the meat of this thing. Let's let, let's start talking about the El Novalero. And, and Ryan, maybe you can talk to us a little about the location and you know just about this wine in general. And if there's a question I have, I'll try to bring it up and I'll look for the questions on the on the chat too. Yeah. So for for those of you that can see Matthew, uh, if you have multiple people up, or um, he's his background is San Giacomo. Perfect. That is El Novalero <laughs> right behind that. Uh, if you can see him. Um, He'll come back around. You'll see it again. He's got some photos to bring up. So El Novalero is a bench land vineyard uh, west of the town of Sonoma. It's right in this precipice where the Petaluma Gap um, and the San Pablo Bay uh, meet. And what that does is it creates this kind of big channel of wind uh, that, that drives down the vigor in this location, keeps the vines smaller, um, you know, really kind of small canopies. But uh, it's planted to Elno, um, Robert Young clone, and it's it's just a pristine site for Chardonnay. Uh, that that coolness that comes in early really keeps it, you know, cool and protected from heat. Chardonnay doesn't like too much heat. Um, that said, it it just ripens really well. Uh, the other thing is it's so important in these conversations about you know growers and locations is not just the terroir but the culture. Uh, of the people that we work with is the San Giacomos. Um, they've been farming their land for, you know, many generations. Uh, they're up to 95 years of farming now. And, you know, a lot of their values are very similar to ours. So they're wonderful people to work with. 
Uh, and then, you know, they really grow the best Chardonnay in the area. Um, they've allowed us to cherry pick our way through their vineyard uh, and find the very best sites. And so El Novalero is what we believe is their kind of crown jewel. Um, and this wine, I think it's really citrus forward. You know, you really get that big citrus aroma from the Robert Young clone. Uh, it's a type of Chardonnay. And then, you know, we also put it through malolactic fermentation. For those of you who don't know what malolactic fermentation is, that's, that's making for all those buttery, mouthfeel, round qualities that you get in Chardonnay. And, you know, you really have to have a wine that's ready to do that out of the vineyard. Uh, and, and this wine not only stands up and has verve and spice and that high tone citrus, but then you get that nice rounding effect of the malolactic and the barrel age, which it can really stand up to. This is 100% malolactic fermentation. So and, me, and I think that let me cut in there for a second um, about the the malolactic and the flavor profiles and what you said about the Chardonnay having to be able to um, to be able to stand up to that right from the vineyard. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was talking about the Chardonnay one day um, in the winery and Philip walked by. And somebody asked, well, you know, if you go through 100% malolactic, why, you know, why isn't this, why isn't this wine just a, you know, a butter stick? Um, and, you know, and then, and also you said it's aged in, it's got some new oak on it. I don't, you know, it doesn't taste overly oaky. And he said, it's not about the malolactic or the oak. It's, if it's, an, if it's, you know, if it's over oaked or over mallowed, what that just means is it's underwined. It just mm -hmm. means that it wasn't up to par be before you did that to it. It wasn't ever going to stand up to that and still have the integrity and the interest and all of those other components that Ryan was talking about, the, you know, that lemony, you know, freshness that you get throughout there. So the fact that you can have this um, sort of creaminess, great mouthfeel, you get some oak on there, but you still got that great acidity that's, you know, the tart loveliness that's in there um, really speak to this specific area. It means cherry picking, mm -hmm. like Rai was saying, getting the best from an area that, that really wants to push these grapes and in the best way. Um, so I just I just wanted to, to jump in on that because I think it's people, you know, hear 100% malolactic and they think, okay, well, I know what I'm getting. I'm getting this massive, you know, buttery, thing and that's just not the case here there's there's a creaminess it's beautiful it's mouth you know it's rich in the mouth but it's not overwhelming it's something you you know you don't feel like i've just had a meal when you have you know had two sips of this you feel like oh it's refreshing it's lovely um so yeah and, and that comes from the vineyard and then it also comes from you know this this wonderful place that we get to make this wine in the shade uh it's this we have two rooms in the Shea that are just perfectly built for white wine, and they they are cold ferments that really keeps that freshness up. And you know, it's just being able to have a place to pristinely make uh, white wines. Is, I, I'm kind of spoiled having that. You know, a lot of other wineries aren't set up as well for that, and and that really allows us to preserve all of that freshness that we get from the field. You also know what it's like to be in a winery that that wasn't able to do that for you and we had to work really hard to uh to adjust for that back in the day so the fact that we do have this to us we keep saying the new facility i guess you know 2012 some people might not think that's too so new but uh to us we're still amazed and delighted by this new facility that we have that continues to uh you know to show its worth and you know every day um matthew you had said that you've uh You've got your deep culinary training, and and so we've asked you to do some ideas for food pairing. Um, what's your thinking about this wine and food? Yeah, I remember it was, oh man, like back when I first started, I remember Philip would always say that, like you know, when it came to the Chardonnay and Elmo Valero specifically, he was like, you know, I really just like having this with cheese, and that for some reason that just kind of stuck with me. And so one cheese that I've been hooked on, and I don't even. I can't remember who the producer is or what the name of it is, but all that matters is the kind of cheese it is. And so when it's an 18 month aged Gouda uh, that I've been picking up from, you know, just my local Whole Foods in the, the one thing I love so much about it is that like, usually when we get it, we'll try to get like some sort of a bread 
or we have like some sort of like orange marmalade or like apricot jam with it. So something sweet to cut some of the saltiness. Um, in this wine, like it almost gives off, it gives off kind of a little bit of that Mandarin sort of flavor, that tropical fruit. Um, and there's all this racy like freshness to the Old Novelero. And the one thing that I love about like hard cheeses like Gouda is when you bite into it and you get that little pocket that has just like that, that salt flake in there. And there's like a little bit of moisture like inside of there. And it's like, it's like this explosion of like food epiphany. It's like if any, anyone's seen Ratatouille when he like eats the mushroom <laughs> with the cheese and there's like all these like animations going on. It's like, for me, that's where my mind goes when I get a little bit of that salt in between the, like the little chunks and cubes of 18 months, 18 month aged Gouda. So that's my parent. Sounds really good. Oh, yeah. I want some right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the one that I look for all the time is the prima donna Gouda. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That one. And I think that's about the same, 18, maybe it's 24, but that same idea with those little crystalline bits in there. And that's so good. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Well, you guys have been talking about basically tasting notes. Um, you know, we've talked about the tropical notes in there, uh, the citrus and the the floral uh, notes too. And oh, gosh, I'm going backwards with my notes. All right, no problem. Um, we are gonna go into the, uh, the Dutton Ranch Pinot. So we'll slide right into the next piece of the, uh, uh, the grower collection <clears throat> portfolio. Um, Ryan will probably want to talk about this, but I'll say it too. Uh, the the Dutton family again. Um, you know, we we speak about these growers every time we talk about the wines, because the only way we're able to do these is by working with these great growers. Um, and the fact that, uh, like Ryan was saying about the El Novalero Vineyard, uh, same thing is going on with our relationship <clears throat> with the Dutton family. Uh, it's just strengthened year after year after year. Um, and I don't even know, it was, you know, it probably wasn't back as far as the 90s, but but it's been a long time uh, since we've been working with them on in different projects. Of course, the grower collection only came around in 2017, uh, but specifically we call it the grower collection because it is about the growers and it's about this group of people who we work with uh, to get the best fruit. So um, the Dutton Ranch, you know, for those of you who know anything about uh, Sonoma and Pinot Noir, uh, you cannot have, you can't mention those two things without hearing the name Dutton. Um, that's their, their, their legacy there. Um, <clears throat> and they're, you know, great to work with. We've been very fortunate to, uh, to have a great relationship there too. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Right? No, I think that's a great place to start. I, I think uh, Dominic and I were just talking about this wine the other day, and it took us a while to to really cultivate this relationship. You know, we we started in our main vineyard uh, that is many acres at this point. We started with seven rows of grapes, <laughs> and so over time, they just realized that we were good to deal with. Uh, you know, we behave ourselves and. <laughs> and pick on time and do all of those things that, you know, get complicated, but it's been a wonderful relationship. And now they're replanting certain sites, they're planting sites for us specifically. Uh, we have just a, such a synergistic relationship with them, but you know, I, that, that really holds true. And that really, that really translates to wine quality. You know, what you get with this Dutton is a full blooded Pinot Noir and we're not trying to 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 make it something it's not. You know, this this comes out of the field with a certain amount of color and structure and has kind of a, a bigger body uh, just just by itself. Um, we always try to respect what the field is telling us. I think you kind of heard that uh, when we were talking about the El Novelero, and and then this is true of Pinot Noir too. Is is really seeing what a site can do uh, means being there year in and year out and kind of, you know, building our understanding of it. And this place that we're in, you know, in the in the Green Valley of the Russian River uh, is really the heart of the Russian River. Um, 
many people in for Northern California, this is this is like God's land for Pinot Noir. Uh, it's just got clockwork fog. If you were over here in Napa, you know, when it's about 90, you know, 90 plus degrees outside, you go over there and it's still foggy, you know, 78, 80, it's cozy. Um, Pinot Noir is, is like you or me. It likes, you know, 75 to 80 degrees. It just wants a, just a pristine, nice day. And that's what you get out there in the, in the Green Valley, the Russian River on Dutton Ranch. Um, but really, I, I think you get this big blast of cherry, you know, fresh berry. Uh, it kind of, you know, plays with some of that otherness of Pinot, I think, to you, you know, is, is it some sort of herb that you're trying to identify? Is it, um, you know, some people say forest floor, but I think it has a real dynamic uh, aroma set. And, and so, you know, let this wine really open up over time, kind of experience it when it right, comes right out of the bottle. If you can, and you don't have a bunch of guests, you know, let it kind of sit in that glass and, and, and get your second glass really with some oxygen in it and let it, let it really open and sparkle because I think it, it really changes uh, with a little bit of time. Yeah, I'm just, I'm letting everybody uh, try their wine a little bit and, and please, if you have any other questions, I'm trying the wine too, so. Yeah, Man, I think you, I'm glad we you were talking to, about. Uh, I'm glad we decided to take a foray uh, over into Sonoma and and do this project. Uh, you know, every time that we, every time we open these up, every time we share them, uh, I just think it's it's such a great addition to our, you know, what we do here on the on the property, which is focused on Cabernet, uh, to be able to to go out um, beyond what we with this property is meant to do and find places that are meant to do other things and really uh, highlight the best of that uh, is, mm -hmm. is really, uh, it's just a gift uh, for, for us as, as proprietors. Um, hopefully the winemaking team feels like it's a gift there too. You know, I, I've, I've heard it said that uh, the Pinot Noir makers like to suffer. I, I, I'm not trying to make you suffer, Ryan. And I think that you've, you've been, uh, you know, you, you've sort of dis dispelled that myth a little bit, but uh, I guess you can suffer as much as you want to. It's fine. It gets us going and harvest a little earlier than than the Bordeaux. You kind of, you know, you get your you get your harvest juices flowing. You remember what you you did last year. You know, you kind of get going with Pinot Noir, so that's that's fun. Um, I got a, a question from uh, Jim here on the chat, uh, wondering how long we would age the uh, Dutton for. Um, you know. Jim, I, I'd be comfortable, you know, recommending this out into, you know, minimum. I, I think you could do like the six year park. Um, I think age it out to six years, watch it really open up, get some bottle bouquet. Um, these kind of pinots will, will age longer than that. Um, as always, when we talk about aging, proper storage is key. You, you know, you've got to be in that 50 to 60 degree window and you've got to have it on like clockwork. Uh, it, it it really it's as much about those single days at, at 80, those single days above 70 degrees. Those are when things happen. And and so, you know, as with any wine um, to age, just, you know, be careful, make sure you've got backup power, that sort of thing. The right place uh, to do this, because I think that's where people tumble a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I. I'd like, I'd pick this up in the in the six to ten year range uh, and and see what it does. Yeah, um, it's nice to see in the comments, uh, you know, how people are drinking their wine. Um, you know, we've got uh, let's see, Erica was saying that uh, she's got it paired with some hard cheese and olives and almonds and some fresh veggies and a little hummus. She goes, it's getting better and better. Uh, Michael said he's let he let it sit for 45 minutes before we started and uh, and it's awesome and Rye, Rye is a big fan of that he said yeah thumbs up good good job um, so yeah keep it coming uh, we uh, we want to know what's going on in your little neck of the woods you know when we're doing this this way with the webinar obviously you can see us but we we can't see you whereas you know if we're doing a uh, just a zoom uh, you know, back and forth, uh, we get to peek into your your homes. So 
So this way, you're just looking at us. So we don't we don't know. The only way we can know what's going on is uh, is when you uh, let us know through the chat. So uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Matthew, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you one more time. I know you're busy getting into the next line, but uh, um, did you have any thoughts about the Pinot and and what type of pairing you you might do for that? Yeah, I mean, I have like uh, I have two, but I'll I'll try to keep it short for everybody so I don't bore you. Um, <laughs> The first one was my first thought it was my son, who's he's not old enough to drink. He's only like three and a half. But if he could, he would eat a cheeseburger every day at every hour in his life. And so and so like that was the first thing I thought of was just having a burger with this, maybe like some caramelized onions if you get really sophisticated with it. Um, but it wasn't not too long ago. I just had this incredible dish that made me just want a glass of Pinot Noir. And specifically, I wanted the Dutton, uh, but I had duck confit with like a farro salad and like a balsamic like reduction on the plate. So really, really fancy stuff. But um, those were like my two thoughts of where I wanted to go with this wine. So I like that you've got the you got the down home burger and you mm -hmm. got the you know the upgrade yeah. with the with the duck. So you're taking it. You can have it any day. You know whatever, wherever you want to go. That's great. Um, yeah, like the the, yeah, for those who are in the thick of it, like me, where I have a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old, you can't always have sophisticated dinners. So sometimes it's it's mac and cheese and it's burgers and wine can fit in there. We can make it happen. So uh, I'll just I'll just go back to one of the chats here. Uh, Ashley was asking about what about in the glass uh, after two hours? Is, is it losing or gaining? I mean, I would say that it should be absolutely great. Um, you know, watch it, watch it evolve during that time. Uh, it's sort of a, you know, a false, a false aging in some, in some ways. Uh, you may have just given it uh, a year or two. Um, you know, uh, but, but that's no problem at all. Uh, and you know, even if, you know, if you don't finish the bottle and you can get a cork in it, and um, you know, to keep it. Uh, Keep it a little cool. Uh, it should be fine the next day too, um, without any issue. But uh, but in the glass, I think it's just you know if you, if you've got the patience, or if you just happen to forget your glass for a little while and you're doing other things or cooking or something, and you come back to it, it's actually uh, it's a great thing to do because it can be surprising. You can think, wait, wait, this is, is this a different wine? What's going on? Uh, new things are coming up. So uh, I'm all about that. Um, I think with Pinot particularly too, it's pretty interesting because because it has all these little facets in it. Like there's all these little notes that kind of meander around and change. Um, yeah. Um, so we're switching gears here a little bit. We've eased in with the Chardonnay, sort of sort of gotten a little little more intense with the Pinot, but we're gonna, it's gonna we're just gonna rock it right right into the uh, the deep, deep cab blend of Las Piedras. Um, Las Piedras has been a wine that we've, we've made for quite a while. And in my estimation, it really came about uh, after we started making the Pritchard Hill, um, just, just in the lineup there. And it was, well, gosh, okay. So we've made a, an amazing blend for this little production of Pritchard Hill Cabernet Sauvignon. But we're left with all these bits and pieces that um, that while yes we could blend them in the other wines, but maybe we could do something you know with with some of those uh, and and do, and just sort of let the winemaking team have their way with it. So now, Rye, if I'm completely off base there, you let me know. So I'll I'll let you talk about the the real winemaking part. No, uh, you know, Las Piedras is just uh, so fun to make um, because so I'm just gonna read you the blend and then we can talk about the blend and talk about where it comes from. You know, uh, we've got some big pictures of rocks that you can see, which is this, what this wine is named after. But so it's 58% Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% Malbec, 11% Petit Verdot, 10% Cabernet Franc and 6% Merlot. And so you're getting uh, this very dynamic uh, Bordeaux blend and yeah, uh, we've got some rocks pulling up out of developing a, a field up here at Pritchard Hill. So this was the provenance of the name of this wine. Uh, we love rocks here at Pritchard Hill. Uh, rocks, hillside growing, 
uh, that's where we see the very best Cabernet. That's the very best Bordeaux varieties. Uh, it's a lot of work for our team. They go by and take out all these cobbles and, and things that the tractor won't get afterwards. But after all of this hard earthwork, um, we on our volcanic soils, you just get uh, an amazing different side. Uh, and, and it's a huge act of labor and love. And, and I, I kind of get to reap the benefits because then I get to make these wonderful wines from each side. But Las Piedras is just- Before, um, you, before you go, um, I'll just let you all know. Um, so they want us to go through the, the blend again, and we will. If you have the bottle, uh, the nice thing, I really love it. Uh, this is one of two wines where we actually print the blend on the back label. So uh, it's great for me when I'm doing a wine dinner because I don't have to remember it. I can just look on the back and I can you know, sound like I really know what I'm talking about. Um, but the blend for, for this uh, 2019 Las Piedras, again, is the is 50% Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% Malbec, 11% Petit Verdot, 10% Cabernet Franc, and 6% Merlot. Rye, it's all you. And so where we start with Las Piedras is, is just, you know, we think about half Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, we kind of start with this idea that we want a majority Cabernet Sauvignon to kind of you know be foundational and structural to the blend. But the wonderful thing about Las Piedras is on any given year, you will see that blend drastically change. Uh, is there more Malbec? Is there more Petit Verdot? Um, do we have enough Cabernet Franc that we can actually put it in the blend? Uh, is the Merlot singing? So because of that, we will change this every single year to really show you where vintage strength where the very best of the vintage varieties are are playing. And, and that's what makes this wine so much fun to make is, is I get to play the strength. You know, we start with this wonderful Cabernet Sauvignon, but then I want to highlight, you know, some Malbec and some, some kind of Petit Verdot with some gusto to it and blue fruit. And all of these things come together to build this wine. And, and it really, the interplay is, is quite fantastic. Um, another kind of, you know, pump for two, 2019. I keep telling people if I could live in 2019 for the rest of my vintage days, um, I would. It, it was a beautiful vintage, really long, moderate growing season, no heat spikes, no frost, no cold, no rain. Really, it was just a gift of a vintage. And I think you'll see that in this wine is it's, it's a power, it's a power player. Uh, it's got a lot of blue black fruit, but then you get the nuances of the Cabernet Franc. That, that makes that texture really round out. Um, then you've got, you know, Malbec giving it red fruit, Pivardo contributing blue black. And it's just an interesting wine and, and it's a pleasure to, to be able to make it. Um, Rai, I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, can you tell us uh, about malolactic and, and red wines? And- uh, Yes, Cabernet sure. So all wines, all red wines go through two fermentations. Uh, the first one you all know well is the one that we really love. It's the sugar bricks in the field, sugar to alcohol. And that's the primary fermentation. That's what we do during harvest. That's when we're busy pumping over, busy doing fermentations. That's the first fermentation. The second fermentation is from malic acid to lactic acid. And that's done for stability, but also rounds out the mouthfeel. Um, most people don't really know what malic acid is. If you've bitten a big, tart, green, granny sniff, that, that puckery acid, that, that's malic acid. So by putting it through a secondary fermentation, we use some cool bacteria for that. They just kind of ferment that away. And then lactic acid has less acidity to it. Lactic acid is what you find in, in butter and cheese and milk. And so it just softens the profile of the wine. It also makes them more stable long-term and, and their ability to age um, through the decades because they're, they're stable wine. So that's, that's why we do malolactic on red wine. It's a great question. Well, I just, I know that people, um, you know, are used to hearing that more for those of us who, you know, those people have heard that term and are aware of it uh, with Chardonnay. And I think people are less aware that, uh, that it's something that uh, uh, can occur in other wines too. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, 
there was a question about uh, Matthew answered it. You know, I have the uh, a few of the 2013 Las Piedras drink it now or or sit longer. You know, either one. Both. You know, uh, I think it would be great to uh, to lose a bottle of this Las Piedras in your cellar for the next 15, 20 years. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think you'd you'd find you'd had something really, really spectacular. Um, but thirteen, that was a monster year. And it's just now getting to that point where it's um, you know, it's mellowed a little bit, but it's still it's still in your face. It's still a you know a really bold, a, amazing, beautiful wine. Uh, but again, you know, beautifully balanced, but that year just gave us a lot of strength, a lot of power. Um, and so being able to have a wine that was accessible early on in 13 was a trick, um, but it, it was still super powerful. And so it's it's showing that um, I think 13 specifically is a year that uh, that you know can age really really beautiful beautifully. Um, but you know 10 years in the 2013, uh, I just had one the other day, not the Las Piedras, but the uh, but the signature, and it's really beautiful. So. Um, yeah. I encourage you to do both. Have enough in your cellar that you can, you know, have one today and one in ten years. Um, did we uh, did we talk about uh, any possibility of food pairings with this one yet? I don't think so. Not yet. The the Las Piedras. One of the one of my favorite things I like to do with this wine is uh, what is called bridging in cooking and, and food and wine pairings, where you cook with the wine in the same dish that you'd intend to serve it with. And so one of my favorite dishes to make, and my wife doesn't enjoy me making it because it's a whole day process for me, um, and I destroy the kitchen, um, but it's making braised short ribs. Uh, it's like one of my like guilty pleasures. And like if I'm just flying around the, the meat section and I see, you know, really good plump short ribs just in the meat, in the meat rack, I'm like, oh, I gotta get them, gotta get them. Um, and I like to use this wine to kind of what we like to call is like deglazing the the pan once you sweat and saute all the vegetables and uh, the meat itself. You add that wine in, you get all this great uh, sort of meat proteins that stick to the bottom of the pan. That if you don't have the heat too high, it won't burn. But if you have it just right and you get that wine in there, you can get up all of that great flavor with this wine. And then you let the alcohol, of course, cook out because braising ribs takes a couple of hours. But that's one of my favorite things that I love having with our Las Piedras is to take it, cook with it, and then serve it with this wine. So, Matthew, I, I think I'm going to start planning a dinner party <laughs> where I'm going to invite you and you're going to cook. Um, one sorry, day. but no, you're that, gonna... that's what's going to happen because I'm I'm pretty excited about everything you're talking about. Uh, and I think that's the right uh, the right thing to do. So we're we're ready mm -hmm. for you anytime you're out here next. We'll we'll get a few people <laughs> yeah. together and and you can pair all you want. I love it. We'll even, <laughs> we can, we'll even let you pick a couple of wines that might not uh, be on the regular menu. Yeah, we'll, say we'll pull some of the 2013 Las Piedras out. So. Right. Certainly, some of our club members are blowing up the chat. They want to come too. So yeah you're on the hook now matt <laughs> yeah i've retired out of the kitchen but for certain occasions i'll i'll make an appearance doesn't sound like it no <laughs> officially you might have but the love yeah. is you feel it um all right so you know i would love it if uh if any of you and no pressure at all but if you have any specific um you know tasting notes of your own what are you getting in these wines, put it put it up in the chat. We're we're happy to talk about it a little bit. Uh, uh, Mary, very nice telling you telling us this. Uh, one of her favorite wines, and it drinks wonderfully. Look forward to it every year, uh, as do I. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody's talking about doing a uh, uh, similar approach to what you were talking about with the short ribs, but uh, mm -hmm. doing a wild game sort of asabuco style. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. You know the problem with with when we do these, it's it's right before dinner. Yeah, that, that we for us now for you on the East Coast, it's a it's a little later. But you know, I get really, I get really ramped up, and by the by the end, I'm just salivating, and I, I run home immediately and and start you know chowing everything I can because I've really built up, especially when people like Matthew are talking about these great pairings. So, um, 
So I think we've got one more specific wine. And this is a wine that uh, it was a one-time deal. Uh, the, the altimeter came about <clears throat> because basically uh, this was a vineyard that we had been buying some fruit from. Uh, and uh, you know it was going it was uh, going into our signature cabernet and and some of it might have even made it into the Las Piedras from time to time. Uh, but it just was singing so loudly uh, on this 2018 year that you know we we thought, you know, we make the hideaway and it's a hundred percent cab. What about making a little bit of 100% cab from this really special vineyard uh, altimeter? Yeah, tiny, tiny bit. Um, so again, I don't, I don't know that this will ever happen again. Uh, and uh, you know, who, who knows? I guess don't never say never. But ultimately, um, this is just a, a really special iteration of Cabernet Sauvignon from an incredible vineyard that is not on Pritchard Hill, but it's in the same. Uh, Eastern hillsides, uh, similar elevations to what we have here. Uh, it's actually, I think, officially in the Atlas Peak um, Appalachian, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, just just a big favorite of ours. So, Rye, can you take us through a little bit about the, the process here and uh, and how this wine is put together? This and you know, this was a this was a one and done thing. So, uh, so hopefully you remember how this happened. Yeah, and I'm 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 saddened that it's a one and done thing, but at the same time, it's such a beautiful, beautiful highlight. Um, as Dominic said, this is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, kind of just speaking about how we source from the eastern hills of Napa. Um, every vineyard that we go visit, we you saw the rocks in the pictures earlier. Um, we go looking for vineyards that remind us of home. And by home, I mean Pritchard Hill. This rocky terrain, rugged vineyards, um, typically on a slope. And, you know, we found this vineyard altimeter in Atlas Peak. Atlas Peak is different than Pritchard Hill. It's a cooler um, climate because the bowl of Atlas Peak opens more southward towards the bay. And so you get this cooler climate and and it really kind of um, evolves the darkness in this wine. Uh, it's a very dark fruited, blue, black, you, you know, lots of black currant, lots of cocoa, castif, um, those really deep, you know, chocolate cocoa nib notes. I, I think you get a lot in this wine, but it's a, it's just a vineyard where immediately when we found it, uh, we contracted for all of it. We wanted to bring it here um, because it has, Four different clones of Cabernet. They all add a different level of a different aroma, a different texture, a different spice to to the the whole profile of this wine. And and it's just a, a kind of a gift of a vineyard to be working with. So here it is highlighted because also in 2019 it it had gotten over some of its kind of young vine angst and and chose to just uh, surprise us. And, and and do something in 2018 that it hadn't done before. And and so we we highlighted that here. And I think that, you know, we're talking about 2013, uh, you know, Las Piedras or Signature earlier. This is a similar wine. This is your 20 year wine. You know, if you want to lay something in and really watch it grow and change, you know, put this away. Uh, you can age this. It's got the structure, it's got the power. Um, and it's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. So then you also get to observe how Cabernet in isolation also moves forward through time, which is a pretty unique wine. You know, here at Chapelet, we typically blend most of our wines to be able to be confident that this is of that kind of superlative quality and, and is 100% variety it is a big compliment, I think, to this vineyard. Um, Matthew, I'm seeing some... Uh... Some questions. Uh, uh, one of them is, can I please just get one or two more <laughs> bottles of altimeter? Yeah, let's say I saw Michael's you... chat, and so yeah, we only had two bottles to to offer to the to our members. But like I said, Michael, yeah, shoot us an email or give us a call, and we'll definitely take a look to see what 
what we have flying around and we'll do our best to, to get you taken care of. I know we do have Magnums. If anyone's looking for some large formats for the 750s, yeah, we just uh, let us take a look. But yeah, give us a shout and and we'll uh, we'll go we'll go digging through the cellar, see what we can find for you. So and and you know it may mean taking a trip out here to the winery uh, specifically to look for those uh, because there are times when you know for whatever reason we we get a return. You know maybe somebody wasn't home to sign for the for the package and and then it comes back and. Um, you know, so we men, we may end up having a, a bottle or two that randomly shows up, but really, uh, it was uh, this is one that's that's pretty special. And uh, you know, if you got the two bottles in there, um, decide when you want to open up the first one. And my guess is you're going to want to save the next one uh, for for some sort of special occasion. Uh, maybe maybe let it uh, get a few years on it. It certainly certainly will age really really beautifully. Uh, so there's no question in that at all. Um, you know, it's when we go and we source, like Rye was saying, uh, outside of our vineyard for the um, for the Bordeaux varietal grapes, whether it's you know Merlot or Malbec or Petit Bordeaux, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, um, <clears throat> it's it's always about finding some place that that feels like home, uh, and uh, you know these eastern hills of the of the Napa Valley um, have some similarities, and you know they're none of them are going to be specifically Pritchard Hill, and we're very lucky to be exactly where we are. It does not mean that there are not other exceptional vineyards out there, um, and so when we do look to you know to source fruit, um, it's from places that we are really excited about. It's not just oh we need to fill a bucket and let's you know get the fruit from anywhere. Um, Believe me, I wish that were the case because the prices of this good fruit um, are astronomical. Uh, and uh, but you know that that's what we're here to do. We're here to make the best wine that we can make uh, from you know from wherever we source it. And of course, you know the the heart of that for us is Pritchard Hill. It's what's behind me in the in the photo. Um, but when we go farther afield, you know you you want to recognize the the specificity of site. Uh, and play to it in, in the best way. And I think that this altimeter really speaks to that uh, in an amazing way. So thank you, Rye and team for, for making this happen and in such a special way. Yeah, wonderful highlight. And, you know, similar to 2019, uh, for those of you with 2018s uh, in your cellar, I think you're looking at, this is really a, a, a double play, um, you know, 2018 and 2019, two great vintages. So uh, yeah. lots, lots to love there. Um, now, Matthew, and that's going to make us hungry again, isn't he? <laughs> I'm guessing that you have some ideas about this one. Um, I do. I, I can take a guess at what you might be saying about this one. I'm going to let you do it all on your own. Probably. I mean, my, my simplest way with, with our Cabernets, cause they're so special and they're so rare. And, um, when you get wines like these, you're always like, man, when is going to be the right time to open this wine? Um, or what's that special occasion? And for me, it's any time I'm literally firing up the grill and grilling a nice steak. It's as pretty as simple as that. I mean, whatever your favorite cut is, whether it be strip, flank, uh, tenderloin, or T-bone, uh, tomahawk. Uh, I just love all of our Cabernets with just a Risk really it. nice grilled steak. So, yeah. All right, right on. Well, that. I'm ready for that too. Yeah. Uh, so I I will encourage, we're getting towards the end of our time here. Um, so if you have any more burning questions for these, uh, these oh, dry aged ribeye, yes, I'll, I'll take that. That'd be fine. Um, yes, sir. So any more questions for Rye, for me, for Matthew, uh, you know, we'd love to hear them. Um, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll continue on for a bit and then look for the questions uh, as I'm talking. Um, Matthew, I think uh, because we've already had some questions about it, um, maybe you can talk about what uh, what a reorder looks like for uh, for the club shipment, if anybody's interested in any of that and how you can facilitate that. Yeah, yeah, right now we're, we're in our reorder period. So for those who are have been with us for a little bit and those who are, are newer, um, we typically like to do a reorder period about a month after we kind of start the communications of our shipments. 
And so what that is, is once you accept your shipment, we open up a reorder period of 20% savings on the wines that are in the release. Now, the bummer is, of course, we had a very limited amount of lost Piedras and Altimeter. So the reorder, we can't do those with Altimeter and Lost Piedras, but we do have the Il Novo Valero and the Dutton Ranch Pinot Noir. Um, so on the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir. And I'll put the code in the chat too, but uh, you should get an email from us as well. And it's just Feb, Feb 23 reorder. You just use that coupon when you're online with us and it'll automatically apply that 20% savings on the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir. And then for those like Peter and Michael and anyone else who are looking for more Lost Piedras and Altimeter, keep, like I said, keep buzzing us and keep bugging us. We'll we'll keep poking around and see if we can find more. For some reason, wine always tends to show up somewhere for us. And so we'll make it happen. For is, you. is that why our library is looking so small? Could be, could be. All right, I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to watch more carefully. That. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, the next wine club shipment uh, happening in May. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we're also going to have a, a wine club event May 20th. And that'll, you know, given given the good weather hopefully that's going to be happening then uh, we'd like to do it on the meadow uh, so you know check in with matthew if there's any questions about that uh, he'll keep you informed or your other club ambassador um let's see a couple upcoming events uh amy my wife and i will be doing a wine dinner in laguna beach at uh, broadway by amar on uh, april 26th um We've got a really fun uh, thing happening this summer, and it's something that our family has done uh, for for many years. Uh, sometimes we skipped a, a year, but somebody almost every year for the past, I don't even know how many, 12 years, maybe more, um, we've done a river trip uh, and usually down the salmon middle fork of the Salmon River in Idaho. Uh, this particular year, it'll be August 6th through 12th. Um, David Frankie and his wife, so our managing director and his wife uh, will be leading that. And then my daughter Reese will be there, who is uh, culinarily gifted, loves wine, and uh, just happens to have fallen in love with uh, with rivers um, because of those trips that uh, that we took our kids on when they were young. And she's been a river guide for the last couple of years, uh, working. Uh, in California and also has done uh, some trips in the Grand Canyon and has uh, helped out with this company in um, uh, in Idaho, uh, Idaho River Adventures. So uh, I believe there might be uh, a few spots left on that. Um, so check in with us, check in with Matthew. He can check in with uh, with David, Frankie and, and see what the, the possibility is. It is so amazing. It is such an incredible time. And we bring a ton of wine, so that's all good. <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, Dominic, this might be one of your favorite trips that I've ever oh, yeah, heard you do so on all of your wine adventures. Like, yeah, like yeah. you just want to get right back on that river again. Well, you know, it's so special. We don't we don't have the opportunity in our lives these days to get away from our technology in the way that we should. I don't believe um, this forces you to do it. There's no cell co phone coverage out there. There's no, you know, uh, there's no power. Uh, you're on the river for six days and five nights. You're, you know, active during the day, and you get great meals uh, when you, you know, when you get, you know, when you uh, dinner is being prepared. Oh, oh, I somehow I got my video off. Sorry. <laughs> um, when you get to camp, dinner, uh, the dinner is being prepared. Next morning, an amazing. Is my video gone? You are gone, Dominic. I don't. I don't know why. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. All right. Keep well, just, just imagine that I'm there. You can have my. my yeah, we got picture. a great photo of you. So. Um, anyway, the the time on the river is just it's it's phenomenal, and I encourage anybody, whether you do it with us or not. Of course, if you do it with us, you're going to have some amazing walk. Uh oh, I think we lost him. Well, I think we've lost Dominic, but we're just about at that time, everyone. So I'd like to just say, 
peers. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, and hope to see you out here in California on Pritchard Hill soon. Thank you very much. And hopefully Dominic can close us out. Yeah. Good night, all. Good night.